could all be edited, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we don't got to do that, though. <laughs> it's easy for me because I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, you've been kind of null and void this whole entire go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to another episode of Forging Brains podcast. I'm your host Riley Kirkpatrick with my co-host Gavin Cooper. Today we got a cool guest. Uh, everybody, I'm sure if you've been in the competition world, especially, I guarantee you've seen one of his items in the prize pool. Uh, and I bet you've either seen his items or you've used his item. We got Dan Salcedo with us today of the Salcedo Hoof Knives. Man, thanks for joining us today, Dan. You bet. Yeah, great. thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. You got Man. it. So how is it just hotter than shit down there right now? No, actually, I'm mid-state, so, you know, we're at 4,800. Um... So I'm two hours away from what everybody considers Arizona. Oh, the hot part. <laughs> you know, the valley, uh, Phoenix, oh, yeah. Scottsdale, stuff like that. So I'm up in the mountains. Um, cedar trees, juniper, uh, you know, yeah, mountains. It's good here. So oh, we're hot. like 80s, 80s today. Oh, that oh, sounds damn. great. <laughs> yeah, we got thunderstorms rolling in every evening so it's cooling everything down so yeah it's beautiful now do you guys got like uh you gotta watch out for wildfires with those thunderstorms wildfires is uh <laughs> <laughs> we we kind of embrace wildfires being on the yeah. ranch because a lot of shit could be burnt down for sure up yeah. there um Forest is kind of mismanaged for sure, probably as you know. Yeah. So, yeah, anytime there's a lightning strike, it's like, hell yeah, bring it on. No <laughs> kidding. <laughs> yeah, that's no, that's not us around here right now, man. Like, I keep on, I keep on thinking I'm gonna watch my power hammer get the shop melted around it one of these days. <laughs> like, you know, so I think our closest neighbor is like five miles away. So uh -oh. with very few houses out this way, I would assume a tanker could fly by one pass and all of my stuff would be saved. So, so yeah, yeah. Uh, inside the ranch headquarters here, um, you know, everything's pretty much grazed down. Like we just let our horses run inside the headquarters, which is, I don't know, 250 acres or so. Uh, right. My brother's out here his son and uh yeah so you know we, we got equipment dozers stuff like that so if there was a fire i'm sure we could break to save my press and my power hammer too <laughs> yeah the yeah. important stuff <laughs> the important stuff exactly no that's so, nice you guys yeah we're not too worried about buffer. fires oh yeah that's a good deal yeah and at least at least not too damn hot that you can still get out in the shop and get some stuff done huh yeah, and the way I set my shop up, I have a pretty good breezeway going through where my forges and stuff are, but it seems like it's very seldom that I ever hardly get to go in that area <laughs> anymore. In it's nice like area. I'm in the, the grinding and buffing part of my shop, which uh, does not have a breezeway. So. so, yeah, there's no internet out here. So I just went from Viasat to Starlink, thinking Starlink was going to be better and Actually, so far it has been, but that's what so everyone else has told me. It's gonna gone go. it. <laughs> yeah, some people say it's great, and then some people say that it like uh, it'll always be cutting on and off like that because it's always jumping from like one satellite to the next satellite or some deal. Like, I think all of the satellite one. ones are the same way. Hmm. Oh man, so, they suck. They suck. <laughs> it's yeah. better than nothing. <laughs> yeah. That's what we got at home is is uh, Viasat. Oh, it's, it's pretty much shit. <laughs> yeah. It is, and it seemed like every month I'd run out of high speed data. You know, within oh yeah three weeks or something. Yep. Yeah. So then, then I was fun. having to buy more all the time. Uh, ours is seasonal as shit. Like if there's leaves on the trees, our internet's horrible. 
Like, if the leaves are off the tree, the internet's a little bit better. But like, <laughs> right, right now, it's really bad with the smoke all in the air. It's like you don't get hardly any internet at the house. So, it's so where's the crappy. fires up there? Do you got them in Oregon or? Yeah. Yeah, we you got do? Yeah, we got two pretty good fires going not that far from here. Oh, no shit? Yeah, one's at like 25,000 <clears> acres or something like that. I, I, I'm, I might be, it might be closer to 20, but it's ripping. Like, yeah, it it's all on national forests, and they're just not touching it. They're just letting it go. Is it as bad as uh, when I, we were down there for the team practice last summer when I was just hanging out, and it was like death days there? Yesterday was that smoky. Yesterday Fuck. was that smoky for sure. It was it was smoky like that, and it was like 110 degrees. Man, it was awful. You know, it sounds like everybody's having super hot weather this year, and Phoenix has had hot weather. I mean, it, but it's Phoenix, and we always it's summertime. Yeah, yeah. But it seems like other states have been oh, having man. way more unseasonably warm weather. We're, we have been just crazy dry. Usually our fire season doesn't start till like end of August, September is usually like right when our fire season starts kicking up. Like it's been dry for long enough. But this year, like our fire season started like end of July, August, beginning of August. It was already, we were having fires everywhere. And it, we just been so long without rain. It is, everything is wicked, wicked dry right now. <laughs> it is crazy. We're not too bad. I mean, there's green. Oak brush looks good out here. It's it's decent this year. It, oh, it's actually nice. been a pretty good year for Arizona. That's surprising to hear. Yeah. yeah I don't really think time. of Arizona being green. Well, that and then you hear the news and everything talk about how hot, uh, you know, we've been getting and how there's been heat-related deaths and everything. And uh, But I'm just going to say that's probably yeah. all the time but they're just reporting on it more now <laughs> yeah exactly I'm using this fear choose, tactics choose what exactly you want to highlight in life yeah <laughs> <laughs> so did you did you grow up in arizona yeah and did you grow up in the area that you live currently no i did grow up down in the valley uh phoenix area okay um Northern Phoenix, uh, Northern Scottsdale, whatever, um, which it was beautiful back then. And so much of Arizona is just blown up. Uh, even up here where I'm at has just blown up. Um, it's not even recognizable down there. Uh, so yeah. yeah, I graduated high school down there. And then as soon as I graduated high school, moved up here. What oh yeah. You, what'd you move up there for just to get away from the town or no, uh, dad ended up finding this, not the ranch we're on now, another one. And it was a small one, a little horse kind of place and came up here, built rope and arena, built the barns, all that stuff round corral and then this place came up for sale because it was in bankruptcy and bank owned and so we ended up doing a pretty damn good swap on properties because the bank just wanted out of this one so uh i think probably 90 or 80 87 i've been here since 87 i didn't know that you could do that with houses like just swap titles over like that well it was bank owned and the bank wanted out of this because this was costing a tremendous amount of money for them to just sit on um mm. you know to make it nice looking you know so we have irrigated fields out here and they were running the pump they were irrigating the fields um i think there's 60 acres of irrigated fields well when i when we got this and I started running the irrigated fields, we started getting the APS bill and it was like a dollar 75 a minute to pump. And oh, I just geez. looked at dad and I went, uh, we could buy semi loads of hay cheaper than we can <laughs> irrigate these. So Holy we quit that smoke. like right away. Yeah. So the bank wanted out of that though. I see. That makes sense. 
I yeah. imagine so. And was the place that you guys were in, was that just more of a sellable place? Like a smaller little, like more of a, a gentleman's place. So like people would be wanting into. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened with it. Um, guy, guy came in, bought it, just loved it, loved all the work I did. Um, and then he kept it, I think for about 10 years and then he sold it. Um, and I think it sold two other times since then. Oh, really? So it's and changed the, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty so, cool, though. Yeah, big time. And so did you did you grow up roping and everything like that? Grow up since a little kid? No. Uh, probably started roping when I was 16, 17. Um, okay. Just, and, yeah, just hitting a few little jackpots. Kind of hit a few more. Uh, never was really a big jack rock, jackpot, you know, team roper kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, never liked loping a horse around an arena too much. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, uh, jackpot, I didn't, you know, won a couple of little jackpots, and that's about all. But yeah. you guys grew up around horses and stuff like that your whole life, though, huh? Most of my life, yeah. 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 And then... Uh, so when we got this place, uh, I think it came with a 550 head cow calf permit. Uh, had another 50 head of bulls. Um, I basically was running it for my dad. Um, and then in 90, 95, 94, we had 24 inches of rain, probably your typical year. Uh, blew out all of our stock tanks and <laughs> then we went straight into a drought from there. It was so bad Jeez. with moisture and rain blowing out our stock tanks. I could not even get a horse back and go check on the cattle. I mean, I was having uh, prolapses, afterbirths, uh, sloughed calves, the works. It was horrible. And then we went straight into the drought. Um, so then we got our permit jerked in half my brother had he was running another piece off of this main headquarters mm -hmm. um where he was doing 350 head of calves well think about 90 percent of this is for service lease okay so they took his permit away completely until they seen fit and then uh they took my permit from 550 down to 250 so that's basically what started my shoeing and my brother took over the place oh oh man so so when you say that you had a two you had a permit for 500 cow calf you mean on government land not just a permit to run on your land just so everyone knows what you're right about. yeah yeah so our place is uh, you know, deed wise, we have a little over a section and then the rest, all the rest of it is all, uh, for service lease. Okay. Mm. Nice. <laughs> and that's the way most of the ranches are here in Arizona. They're either state leases, BLM leases, or for service leases. Hmm. That's, that's pretty wild. And so like they, they, they judge your next year's permits off of how well you did the year before or off they're just hell? like, or they're pulling your permits because they're saying the land can't handle it after, during the drought. Correct. Correct. Oh. So they're basing it off of what kind of rainfall we had basically. So in and, this case it was, totally you know, they do their hands. little feed monitor deals and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah. So that's what they're basing it off of. Yeah. That's so that's a pretty rough deal, though. How to, it affects people's livelihood pretty, pretty quickly, doesn't it? Well, it does, and it does up there in Oregon. I know for oh yeah the same exact reasons. And um, my son-in-law, he's from Oregon, and they ended up losing all of their uh, timber, you know, their wood cutting operations. Um, you know, and most of those are all for service too, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They just stop letting you cut. And then those, right. get, the land just gets packed full and they just, 
Yeah, it's a weird thing. In Oregon, it's they try to go off, and I'm sure it's the same thing down there. They choose some random wildlife they're going to save in the area, <laughs> right? Like we went through the spotted owl deal, you know, back oh, yeah. when I was a kid. That was everywhere. And right now we're saving the beavers. Like we, that's, <laughs> that's what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen. It's like, so <laughs> they're, they're pretty sure the beavers are dying because loggers are cutting trees. And so it's, Gee, uh, many crickets. it's a pretty rough deal for those, those loggers in their permits that they, <laughs> they get them all yanked and to decide, they also decide where they're going to let those trees leave the country and go to. So you see more and more cutting on private land now. Like you see guys buying little 80 acre parcels and cutting them. So it's oh. a, right. Huh. You see that a lot more. And, and so Gavin, you're, where are you at Gavin? Uh, I'm pretty close to like Seattle area. Okay. So you're Washington. Yeah. I'm about yeah. five hours North of Riley, like pretty gotcha. much straight, straight North. Yep. So kind of pretty much the same, uh, environment as, uh, as Riley. Yeah, I've been to Oregon once, and I've been to Washington once. Okay. What'd you think of it? Uh, which, which part did you go to? <laughs> yeah. Which part did you, uh, yeah. So my my daughter was in. Uh, she made she made her softball team. I was coaching at the time. She made it to the one of the tournaments up there, nationals, and hmm. we went up there. It was in Lincoln, and then. In um, Washington, my buddy was getting married. And this was back when I was like 23, 24. So he was getting married in Kirkland, Washington. Oh, yeah. So I was supposed to be his best man. And this was a Mormon wedding. And <laughs> yeah, it didn't go too well. I couldn't even get my best man speech. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of bars in Kirkland. <laughs> it was beautiful, though. Yeah, it's Both a cool little town. Were very beautiful. Well, a city, I should say. Now, <laughs> is it? It's huge. I mean, you can't even tell the difference between Kirkland, Bellevue to Seattle because, like, everything there is just like all yeah. one thing now. Oh wow! See, it was a small little town back then. That was damn near twenty-five years ago. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's booming. Grown. Yeah, it's grown just in the last seven years that I've lived out here. Like go through some towns and i'll be like holy shit that wasn't there the last time i drove through here you know you know and going to all the shoeing contests you talk to everybody throughout the whole entire country and that's what everybody's saying about all of their towns and all of their states yeah yeah it's a pretty common thing right now people are it's just too many people there yeah, too many, many people. people. <laughs> too many damn Just people. Got too many of the day. <laughs> <That> sucks. <laughs> they need a little managing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then, <laughs> so did you? Did, were you already shoeing your own horses and such? For were you to just go into shoeing horses once the the cow operation got knocked down a little? No, I was. I've been shoeing our horses ever since I was sixteen. Uh, or what I thought was shoeing horses. Mm -hmm. uh, I was nailing iron on for sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did anybody did anybody show you, or you just like see a couple of horseshoers do it? Yeah, I just saw I just saw it being done, and you know, like we always say, it's not rocket science, but there is a flip side to it, and I didn't learn that flip side till I actually. It was kind of, okay, I know how to cut post and stays. I know how to build fence. I know how to do pipe arenas or pipe fencing. Or I know how to shoe horses. And I don't know why I chose shoeing horses because I hate it. I mean, I literally oh, really? hate it. it was, every cowboy hates it, you know? Oh, yeah. You're not yeah. getting paid for it. <laughs> and you sit there and you get one foot done and you drink a glass of iced tea and then you shoe the next foot and whine and complain some more and hate life and you know it might take you two days to get one horse shot and <laughs> so i hated it and but it was what i chose yeah, um, yeah. so did it, did it not just kind of choose you like did people just start asking you or like were you was it a conscious like well I'm gonna it go. was a conscious okay. yeah um and and just to show you how naive i was at that i you know literally uh, went 
okay, there's people out there that are actually doing this for a living, and I think I could do this. And do you guys need light in here? No, you're good. No, you're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, I think this is actually a, a, a actual career where people are getting paid for doing this, you know, pretty <laughs> decent. And so I kind of jumped in that game. And I was in the worst of the worst places, uh, you know, no shade trees, you know, Indian Miserable. horses, um, just, you know, that were going on to dude strings, the worst of the worst. It was, it was horrible. And <laughs> I, I had heard about this, uh, you know, uh, American Fairies Associate, Association having a convention in New Mexico. And I'm mm -hmm. like, all right, well, that's six hours away from me, I'll, I'll take a jump and I'll see what, you know, this industry is actually about. And, you know, that was mind blowing to me. It was insane. Um, and how long had you been like shooing some before you had heard about the AFA then? Probably a year, year and a half. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pretty quick. Um, maybe two years, uh, you know, somewhere in there. Um, were you feeling pretty beat down before you went to that? Like just about the whole deal? You know, cowboy, you're always beat down. So she <laughs> yeah. was just another beat work. down in the life, you know? So, cowboy life is work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's like, you know. <laughs> it's just rough. Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, not the smartest guy on the block, so. <laughs> I think a lot of us aren't very smart. Yeah, that's why, why <laughs> we're shooing here. horses for a living at times. <laughs> but uh, it's is good. there any light that is maybe shine in here? Sometimes that's oh, just I the can. way she goes, you know? <laughs> yeah. Just the way she goes. I think I'm on pause, so. Uh, Where is wait, wait, we to get back here. <laughs> yeah, we don't necessarily choose it, but like it chooses you, and then all of a sudden you're doing it for however Where many years. It? With that being said, um, honestly, the best industry, hands down, bar none. Um, mm -hmm. You know, once I actually learned and figured out what, you know, it was kind of about and how deep it went um, and made some, you know, met some of the greatest people around, then it literally became the best profession, period, I think. Do you remember some of those things you saw at that convention that was like, like Oh was there like yeah, a light bulb question. moment there? Like the vendors. Um, you know, I literally thought there was one brand of nails out there. I literally <laughs> thought, you know, there was one brand of shoe out there. Um, what hoof knife were you using before? Oh shoot, I probably started out with a frost just like yeah. everybody else. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, if and that's if I even used one. I don't even know if I, I was used gonna one. Say, <laughs> you know, I was hoping was, you were going to say you actually had one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was usually just, you know, because on the ranch, I never used one. You know, it was take your nippers and just remove some soul and, you know. Get some yeah. of that stuff out of there. <laughs> yeah, and then, shoot, I, we, you know, we didn't know what soul pressure was, you know. I mean... <laughs> We didn't even know what level was for crying out loud, you oh, know. Man. So, and those her, those horses were working for a living. They weren't just kind of dicking around. Like, that's fine. Well, <laughs> with all that being said, though, uh, ranch horses are kind of a different deal because we would take the horses that we were riding. We would literally grab off a mesa, you know, where they're. We got most of all the horses turned out on a big Malapai mesa. So we would literally be shoeing ET, you know, feet, you know, with a little bit of toe hair and two heel quarters. And that was Busted. literally all you had to nail to. I mean, they were, e they were walking on their coffin <laughs> bones, basically, when we would bring them up to shoe them. Damn. And we would keep them up maybe for about two shoeings, three shoeings, and then they would go back out and then we'd bring in new horses. So they were constantly getting cycled, you know? Yeah. So but their feet were probably, they're living so much out there. Their feet had to be a little bit used to it. Used, used to being down to like, just used to the environment used to be on that rough ground. Yeah. Oh yeah. Guess, yeah. And like kind of calloused. So, yeah. If they weren't, they were, they were dead. I mean, yeah. we would literally find them dead. 
kind of so, like proves the argument where like everything can't be barefoot in the wild, right? Oh, there's no question about that. So funny story on this one. So buddy of mine, he says, uh, he's got the neighbor ranch here in Skull Valley. And he says, hey, Dan, do you mind if I turn out my one horse? He just won't pay attention to where his feet are. He needs to be in the rocks. He needs to, you know, I said, yeah, we'll turn him out with my horses. So we turn him out and I don't know, three, four, five weeks later, he says, hey, have you seen my horses out there or my horse out there? I'm like, no, I haven't been out there to check on him in a while. But when I get out there, I'll, I'll definitely take a look because it's two hours just to get to this pasture just because the roads are so damn bad uh-huh. and eh, maybe an hour and a half i could literally drive all the way down to phoenix and the time to dr- take me to drive out there just because it's <laughs> you know so bumpy and everything uh-huh so I, I drive out there unload my horse we drive we use a lot of stock trucks around here mm-hmm. so we just throw yeah. things in the back of the trucks and so i drive out there lumber out there in the two-ton kick my horse out i find my horses right off the bat and i'm like damn this isn't looking good for poor mom and his horse (laughs) yeah so make a couple loops can't find them they're in about a section and a half trap and i'm coming back to the corrals and i hear this horse whinny off to the north and so i look up this draw and here he is he's just parked and he's you know whinnying and whinnying and so i'm like oh shoot well so I start going up there, and he is planted. I mean, planted. He wouldn't walk to me, come up to me, and <laughs> he's nickering the whole time. And so I get up there, and I literally had to put my rope around his neck and tug him just to have him walk to the corral. And so loaded him onto the two-ton, took him home, and I found a piece of cardboard. And uh, I put will work for food on it and hung it around his neck and I brought it. (laughs) What's up, guys? Going to take a little minute to talk about some of our sponsors for the show. One of the largest fairy supply stores in the world is stepping up for Forging Brains Podcast to help you guys by sending you on your way with a cool gift when you use the code BRAINS at checkout. Wellshod carries so many different supplies throughout their warehouse that honestly we could probably do a whole podcast just talking about all the different supplies tools anvils all sorts of products that they carry throughout their warehouse it's insane if you guys haven't been there you should put it on the list to go check them out just to go see them but also to go buy some stuff too their recent products they've been making in-house is anvils they're producing the Scott Anvils as well as the new Scott Eden's 200 pound anvil. I believe they've also been doing the Cliff Carroll Anvils for some time as well. And John Harshbarger talked about that in his episode previously on Forging Brains podcast. So when you guys go to order with Wellshod, either online or on the telephone, use code BRAINS and they'll hook you up with a free product in your order. A little surprise. Surprise gift. We're happy to be working with Wellshod because they are invested in this trade, the same as the rest of us, and not just there for profits and money. Plus, I don't know how you can beat that $10 flat shipping they always have. Like, that's insane. You can't get a better deal than that. So either call them up on the telephone or go online at www.wellshod.com. And when you go to check out on your order, use the code BRAINS. And they'll hook you up with something cool in your order. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about working with Wellshot. This is going to be great. So I hung a, a sign around his neck that said, we'll work for food. Brought it back to my buddy and said, hey, I found this guy out there and you might need an extra hand. So oh, okay. yeah, he just, if I wasn't out there at that time, he would have died for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he was... <laughs> He was done. Jeez. <laughs> he, was, he had all he could take. <laughs> he had all he could take, exactly. Oh, He's geez. probably happy to go home to Bob. <laughs> oh, he was very happy to go home. <laughs> so when you went to that, after coming home from that first convention, did you come home with just a pile of new tools with you? You know, I was so broke at that time, probably not. Um, yeah. <laughs> I 
I came home with every freebie that was given out. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I had my bag of goodies. <laughs> That's um, perfect. But I remember watching the contest, and that just blew my world completely apart um, to where I had no idea that there was actual competing in this. Um, mm -hmm. And the guys were so jacked up and pumped and, um, so you know, I remember Craig vividly just because he had his, you know, oh, yeah. stripes Hold on his it. head. Yeah. And I was going, <laughs> wow. I, you know, I thought horseshoeing was kind of more of a cowboy kind of thing. And here's this dude with freaking, you know, basically a mohawk <laughs> and shaved lines. Yeah, he, yeah. Had like a, he had a flat top. Yeah. Like a, yep. I've seen those pictures. They with a flat <laughs> top and those freaking stripe, the, the race stripes. Stripe. Right. <laughs> oh, so I bet that was an eye opener. <laughs> it was an eye opener. It, it really was. And that, that changed my whole outlook and perspective on what this actually is. And uh, from that point on, it just made it cool. Um, I think. After that contest, I learned about Arizona had a association. And so I became a member of the association and was part of that for probably two or three years and got into my first division one contest. And then I think uh, I started going to enough stuff that they wanted me on the board um and so then i ended up uh did two years on the arizona state fairs association board did you and enjoy then that i like did two that? years uh vice president uh for the arizona association nice did and you kind of enjoy doing being on the board i did for the four years and yeah. after the four years i was kind of done with that um yeah. but uh you know it it gave me an opportunity to, you know, we had all the contests because mm -hmm. Arizona was big at one time. I mean, Arizona is null and void right now. And I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what's going on um, in Arizona. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we had our annual contest that we ran, you know, with California and Colorado. I mean, our contest was one of the biggest contests back in, in the day. Um, and it was really good. We had a huge membership. Um, we had clinics with, you know, Craig, Mark, Kelly, um, you know, Jim Keith, uh, you know, everybody's been out here, um, as clinicians, as, uh, judges and, uh, competing. And it was really good for a long time. And then, uh, as soon as I got off, I know it changed a few hands and then it just kind of went to the wayside what do you think is like a big uh factor that like hurts membership or like what is so, something that kind of i believe then i can't say about now just because we don't have anything going on and we don't get to meet like we used to mm -hmm. um i think then was uh the square toe thing really kicked off hard 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 and so you had the guys that were a part of the association that you know when you're when you're doing that you really don't want to have a clinician you know come in to talk about square toes yeah. and so i think there became a big rivalry um i see and so I, I think a lot of members dropped because certain people weren't coming in doing their kind of clinics and i i i think there was a big deal like that that really just a divisiveness then. Yes. Hmm. yes. That's so interesting. I've never heard anybody mention that relation, but I could see that happening. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. And Scottsdale, the Scottsdale area really took off that way. And I, I literally want everybody to know at this point, I don't care what anybody does. You know, I'm not, I'm not judge, jury and executioner. But I, I do believe that is a big factor what happened back then. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 
that's yeah no i think that's a good observation i've never i've never yeah like i said i've never heard anybody put that relation together that like everybody was kind of together for a little while and then associations kind of split up everywhere and it probably is related to that the square toe thing and like things started like keg shoes different series of keg shoes probably started taking off and so like there wasn't as big of a need to forge anymore you could just buy these keg shoes that already had these modifications and stuff like that and so that split people up pretty quickly i could see that happening yeah that's a good point so Man. yeah and it'd be interesting i don't know if it took off as hard as it did here in every other state uh but i know it it was really big uh in the late 90s early 2000s to where it pretty much took over most arizona uh in that direction wow <laughs> that's so, that's about here it was taken off here i think i bet it was that way around any like metropolis area that had horses you know right anywhere that and, had like a decent supply house <laughs> yeah <laughs> true you know and the guys uh, the guys that were involved are still involved in everything you know they're all good guys and i like i like everybody and yeah. you know i know back then you know when you are competing and they're doing that you know there there was that rivalry to where it was uh it was a thing and uh i don't know if it's age or what but you know to each his own um uh, like i said i'm not I mean, it Judge even shows it's on the the shoeing industry. So, like, it shows oh, its yeah. face just even in the rodeo world. You know, like, you know, bull yeah. riders will be against whatever you know other event, like that kind of same scenario. Oh, yeah. Well, rodeo ropers, all that. You know, I mean, how many times do you have to hear? You know, take more toe, take more toe, take more toe. Toes the enemy, toes the enemy. Um, yeah. So I think that's synonymous with the rodeo roping industry mm -hmm. i would guess oh yeah yeah and i you guys have enough like but you, you're mostly rodeo people around there though aren't you around you rodeo and then cowboys huh so i never did do ranch horses when i once i got out of the dregs of the dregs um then it became and and we all have been there um you know, you, you start off with the dregs and then you start getting involved and then the, the industry tells you you're nobody unless you start, you know, getting barns and you have your barns. And so then you, that is your goal and your purpose to get the barns and, um, you know, get into that field. And so then, you know, you get your barns and then, you lose your barns and you know, <laughs> so it was definitely a full circle cycle with my career. Um, and let's take a minute and talk about another one of our sponsors, Farrier Box. I know you guys probably don't need that Christmas morning feel in the middle of the summer no more, but let's talk about how the subscription base service sets you up with the best of the best products each time you receive their box everything they send out is tested and used by elite farriers so it gets that stamp of approval every time it reaches your do doorstep i don't think there's anything else going on out there in the farrier world that's quite like farrier box at the moment so when you can get products each month every other month i guess that you're on the fence about getting They'll send it to you, and you'll have it at your disposal. Plus, you know, it's going to be handy stuff, so stuff that you're going to use. There's not something I've had that I haven't used yet, but to get a discount, you use code BRAINS for 25% off your first month's order, and that's a pretty good deal if you ask me. Let's get back to it. So the the barn thing was great. I learned a lot with the barn things. I love the barns because um, you got to experiment a lot. You got to do a lot of cool stuff that you wouldn't for, you know, the regular people. And so that was a good deal. I did a lot of rainers. I did the halter barns that were moving in up here. 
So I wasn't having to travel, but you know, 45 minutes um, for the barns that were moving up into my area, which used to be super rural. And um, due to one barn moving and leaving, I lost like 30 head of rainers. Then the halter barn changed um, trainers. So the new trainer brought in, you know, that was four years. It was uh, inside, climate control, wintertime, it could be snowing. I could back my truck in every Monday like clockwork. Um, it, and it was really good. I did that for four years. And it probably took three to four years off my shoeing lifespan <laughs> with those big halter horses just crumpling me bad. Oh, yeah. um, so then I had some... Cutting horses, Don Dodge was a part of, and I was shooing for them for a couple of years. And um, so then, so after I lost pretty much all those up here in this area, because I wasn't wanting to travel all the way down to Phoenix, you know. So once I lost them, I just kind of got on the phone with all the local guys and just said, hey, if you guys are shunning any horses, I'll take whatever you have, you know. And about that time, we started getting the Californians moving in, and they were just inundating Prescott big time. Um, and so they're bringing some, you know, hunters and some jumpers and, um, you know, just really well taking care of uh, pets, I guess. Um, so I started, I finished everything off with just backyard horses, but they all had beautiful four stall barns cross ties, water, power, you know, cobblestone, cement, you know, aisleways. And so it was really good and it was so nice and refreshing to, uh, you know, have that. And, you know, they're happy that you just called them every seven weeks, you know, and they're happy that you showed up. And um, it's like a give and a take, right? Yeah. Between the two. Yeah, oh, I, I I love them. I love those. Like that client you just described, those are my favorite ones, man. Like the bread and butter. Oh, no they're question. Amazing. They're amazing. They and are. They, and they don't use the horses barely, so like you're never like you're not really losing shoes or getting them worn through or anything. It's like it's great. No, they're <laughs> yard ornaments at that point. Yeah. Oh yeah. And you know, if they did lose a shoe, it's like, hey, whenever you're back out this way, come and yep. come and grab it. You know. Um, so, you know, just not high pressure and happy that you're calling and keeping in touch. And so, yeah, it was, it was good. So had you gotten your like certification or anything by this point? No, I never did. Um, okay. I started my process. I, you know, I, uh, this was probably back late nineties, early two thousands, uh, started my my shoe board I passed, my horse I passed right off the bat, but that, that written test was always my monkey on my back. And I just finally just, you know, pulled all my hair out and just said the hell with it. And uh, <laughs> That makes two so. of us. <laughs> it's hard for me too. <laughs> oh, man. I think that's yeah. most, most of us. Like, if you excel in the forging or the horse or something, you're probably not going to excel in the book. It's the way it goes. It's tough. So yeah, I just, you know, and at that point, I just figured, uh, you know, it's not like I'm trying to, you know, be anybody mind blowing in this industry. I'm just, I'm happy where I'm at, and uh, you know, I was happy. I was very happy competing, and I loved everybody that was in the competition world, and. They were yeah. all the best of friends. Um, and everybody that I met while I was competing uh, through Division One, Division Two, then into the Open. Um, you know, it's so funny when I fell off the face of the earth, I was, and then I started coming back, uh, you know, with the knives and started hanging around again. It was like, you know, oh my God, I haven't seen you in 20 years. How are you doing? You know, it's so good <laughs> to see you again. and you know, the bonds that you form uh, with the guys on, you know, competing, because we went, well, my friends here in Arizona, we did everything from uh, Oklahoma to Northern California. Um, yeah. 
and everything in between. And uh, it was just the best time of my life. It was a lot so, of fun. So what happened? What you said you fell off the side of the earth if you don't like, and then came back with the knives. What happened in your transition time? Um, my daughter's softball. Uh, I was coaching her. Uh, you know, she got to the age where she was, you know, on the travel ball. I was coaching the travel ball team. My son, I was coaching his ball team. Um, you know, and so her travel ball leading up to college was, you know, a lot. And then, yeah, life, I guess. Um, but yeah, so yeah. happy to be back again and uh, seeing everybody and being able to talk with everybody and enjoy again. It's a lot of fun. Your son, Logan, he shoes horses as well, right? Yeah. So when he was 13, I just looked at him because he was supposed to, you know, it was summer break and I just said, Hey bud, you ain't licking your nutsack all freaking summer long. You're coming <laughs> with me. And you know, so it's time to go. Uh, he started coming, he would bust the, you know, the, the old nails out of my resets and I taught him how to use the grinder. And, uh, yeah, so he started coming with me every summer and, um, he ended up loving it and liking it. And, uh, I pushed him over to another shoer, um, to go to work for as well. Cause mm -hmm. nobody likes, well, where did you learn that? my dad you know <laughs> so you know so nobody really wants to hear that so i i had him go out with you know a couple other people one person in general and uh he mm -hmm. ended up loving it and man he's killing it he's hot and heavy on it yeah yeah so where did, did you start making your own knives like early on or when did you start making your own knives and tools uh no tools i am not a tool maker okay. at all <laughs> So just hoof knives. Um, just hoof knives. Okay. And the way that started, I was shooing for this guy uh, who's world-renowned knife maker, Bladesmith. And who's, who's that? Is that Larry? Larry. Larry Fugan. Larry Fagan. It's Fagan. Because I saw the other day he posted a story on I follow Larry because Larry is impressive. He's like impressive. He's, oh, <laughs> like it's 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 not and like if people are thinking knife maker, Larry's making pocket jewelry. Like it is jeweled, engraved, top notch. Oh, it's insane, man. It's insane. Like his engraving is bar none the best. It's he's uh he's so and talented. you know, I I wasn't a knife guy, you know. And and that was funny because he says I said, God, I just can't find a good hoof knife anymore because it was really hard to find a Shane knife. And uh, I think John quit making his knives at that point. Uh, John McNerney. McNerney. And, um, okay. Yeah, so it was just really hard to find a knife. And so I was just complaining. And he's like, well, Dan, you know, I make knives. Do you, Have you ever thought about making a knife? Are you interested in knives? And I'm like, no, I really don't care about knives, you know. And... Um, so we ended the shoe in and so I was driving home and I said, God, I was pretty rude about that. You know, I should have said more um, because I'm not a knife knife kind of guy. But when you shoe for so long, you end up being a knife guy. It's just they're hoof knives because uh -huh. they're <laughs> constantly on you, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, if, uh, if a horse, you know, sets back and you need to cut something or whatever, you always got a knife on you. And so the following time I went back, I said, Larry, I'm kind of sorry. I just kind of brushed that off. I am into knives. It's just not regular knives. It's hoof knives. He's like, well, why don't you start making your own? And I'm like, I don't know anything about making a knife. And so he says, well, come over to the shop one day and uh, we'll see if we can't work one out. So, um we did one and it was like, well, that doesn't seem that bad, you know? And uh, so another guy I was shooing for, he said, I was telling him, yeah, I think I'm gonna start making some knives. And he's like, well, did you got a grinder? Did you got a buffer? I'm like, no. And he says, well, I got one. I was gonna start making knives, you know? And now I'm a team roper, you know, retired, <laughs> retired, uh, retired guy. 
And so he went into roping, and so I bought his Hardcore Productions grinder, uh, 2x72, and yeah. a Baldur buffer that he had for $1,200 for both of them. Uh, nice. Drove up to Big Bear, California, picked them up, Wendy and I did, and uh, yeah, so they're... You were in the knife business, just like yeah. that. Off to the races. I was in the... I was in the... <laughs> Research and development <laughs> stages. <laughs> it wasn't even development at that point. It was just mutilating learning. steel and learning how to grind. <laughs> it was oh. pretty ugly. <laughs> Man. How many different knives did you make until you thought like you actually made like a decent one? A lot. A lot? A lot. It, it, this has been probably the most hair pulling out, hair graying experience of my life. I've, I've wanted to take every tool and just throw it out of my shop. I've wanted to quit <laughs> so many times. I, shoeing horses was way easier. <laughs> This has been, oh, this has been hell. Really? <laughs> yeah, it really has. Um, you know, dealing with the wood, um, dealing with heat treats, dealing with, you know, heat treat problems and chips and, you know, uh, just, just even getting a good grind, a good quality grind, getting, getting my buffing down, um, having batch after batch just come back because I, I started heat treating myself, you know, and doing everything myself and over the horn and trying to figure out better ways. And God, it's just been, it's been humbling to say the least. Yeah. yeah people don't realize how hard grinding is and how hard it is to be a good grinder. And I would not even say I'm good yet, you know, compared to the great grinders out there. In fact, I've never even done a flat grind. Oh, just like a regular type knife? Yeah. I, I've put hollows. Like, I've done regular type knives, but I've always put a hollow grind in them. Um, and it's funny because you talk to a lot of other guys and, that make regular knives, and they've never put a hollow grind in. No, it's all about flat, flat, flat. Everything flat, is flat, flat, flat. Everything's flat. <laughs> it's just so, what it's all about. Right. No gaps, no gaps nowhere. <laughs> you know, so with the hoof knives, like you said, you know, there's a lot going on there. Um, and it's, you know, when you're making a knife knife, uh, really pay attention. Make sure your plunges are, you know, even and... You know, make sure your grind lines come up to your spine correctly, you know, and meet and come, you know, taper out to your point. And, and I'm not a knife knife maker by any means, um, but... Yeah, there's a lot to it. But there's, but so then you throw in a, a, a hoof knife and so now you have a step in there and then you have a hook at the end. Yeah. And then you have a belly in there. So it's like... Things that you wouldn't even think about just looking. Well, it's a knife like any other knife, but, you know, when you go to making them, you know, there's so much going on in a hoof knife that, you know, I never noticed or paid attention to until I started making them. But, man, there's a lot going on there. You just have absolutely so nothing much. flat. There's, to work there's, with. that's the hard part. I think that is the hard part. You are stuck, you're handcuffed to such a small area that you can't get a grinder in, but after you got the hook in it and everything, right? You're so handcuffed, and everything it has so much flow and radius. And it is like, especially hard for you because you're not making one offs, you're, tr you're making a somewhat production item that somebody wants to be able to buy four of them, and all four feel the same. Mm -hmm. That's ha that's hard. That's that that was a whole nother learning curve of this whole thing because I, I know that is what people are expecting. Um, yeah. and that's kind of when I transitioned from uh making them all over the horn and you know making every single handle by hand, and it is hard as hell to replicate that time and time again. And and oh, you yeah. know, I'm sure all of your it's spatulas possible. have a little difference to them. Yep. All of your pans, all of your frying pans have a little difference to them. 
every shoe you make it has a little difference to them. So yeah. that was something that probably didn't come into the into my shop till I really had to think about how I wanted to do it, and I had really you know no reference, you know there. Um, so I reached out to a, a dye company down in Phoenix, um, and I just looked him up in the phone book, and he's like, yeah, we'll, we'll, you know, come down and talk to us, you know, so I brought him, you know, my best, absolute best, you know, oh, I yeah. want a dye that'll, you know, fit this, you know, and make this every time. Yeah. And so they did it, and they weren't cheap at all, <laughs> and... No. The, you know, you you don't need just a right. You need a right and a left. Mm -hmm. So I had to have two of them made, and they were they were unbelievable pieces of artwork to me. You know, wow, I've never had a die like something like this that you know collapses, goes up, and so yeah. it just they weren't. It wasn't firing exactly right. So I called the guy up. Hey. You know, we have a few changes, and this guy blew up on me. This is why I don't do side jobs. This is exactly oh, why I don't oh, deal geez. with it. You know, I mean, he went off. No he thought, shit. He thought they were perfect, too. <laughs> I'm like, God, I just wanted a few changes. I didn't want anything. Yeah. You know, just, you know, so... So like you, you probably didn't even know it was a side job. You thought you were just a normal customer. I like thought I was a normal it. customer. Yeah. yeah, but he's used to working with, you know, when they make a die, it does like 50 at one time instead of one at a time, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. So it's crazy. There was Man. a huge learning process in this well, whole thing. Yeah. Well, how long? Oh, so like before you were making them one at a time, pretty much. Like you were yeah. probably doing them in batches. Like I'm sure you were doing like steps at a time. Right. But how long did you sit on the idea of like, okay, I want to do a die and everything, but like you wanted to make sure you had it down first, make sure you had the perfect prototype to give them. Like how right. long did it take you to get there? And what were the things like that you were looking for that you thought made a good hoof knife? Um, I think belly was, you know, number one priority uh getting that right radius um and like i said i i've it, it was probably three to four years before i even went to a die um or decided i needed a die mm -hmm. and then yeah, yeah. so say it was three years but then it was four years probably before i even figured out how to go about even conceiving how to get a die made you know uh that would work um so for and, a while there would you like just get a knife made and then like take it out and try it out the next day and just kind of see how it would work and then like kind of go so from there that's a funny deal because you know that's i i think when farriers get burnt out on their job if 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 i was to go to a contest or a clinic or something or even just ordered, you know, like a brand new Jim Poor knife or a Shane Carter knife. I was I was the giddiest shoer for, you know, a Ready week, to go to two work. weeks, you know, oh, yeah. after getting that or a hammer. You know, I was like, oh, oh my yeah. God, I can't wait. To, you know, so I was that way every time I made a knife, you know, I couldn't wait to get it out there and, and test it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot of... A lot of testing, a lot of handing it, uh, handing it out to everybody I knew that shod. Um, give me feedback, give me feedback, and I'm, and I still always am looking for feedback. I, you know, um, because it's that one thing that we're all trying to achieve is, you know, something good. No boy. We're all trying to achieve that, you know, uh, come up with something that's awesome and usable and and good yeah and were you were you at going back to larry quite a bit on for questions on like your heat treat and stuff like that a lot a lot yeah. and so i'm probably 45 minutes away from larry larry lives in the town of prescott 
and I'm kind of way on the outskirts of uh, the town of Skull Valley. Okay. Uh, nice. So it's about a 45-minute drive. Nice. No, so you say like, kind of come back to where you, you said you got your dyes and you were using them. What, what was going wrong with the dyes? What were they doing weird? They just they they were they would hit here here and here, but miss here here and here, and then they they were a little they were a little stubby. Um, so when they did come down in, they would miss this whole back section. Um, so he just didn't want to talk about any of it. He made perfection and he was done with me as a, as a customer. Sounds um, like most horseshoers. I'm the greatest. <laughs> yeah. right. How yeah. dare you? <laughs> it's definitely yeah. not me. It's you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so so what you- I would literally get a piece of aluminum and put it under this area, you know, so that die would actually hit into the place that it was missing. And I, I fiddled around a lot with that. And so the die thing in itself probably took two years to, and now I'm a slow learner. So when people are out there watching this going, well, he's just an idiot. If it took two years, I mean, I, I really am. So (laughs) it took, it took a lot for me to finally, you know, take a welder. Well, you know, I mean, I was just trying to add into areas and grind and, you know, it took a long time to get these dies to work to where they're, they're at now. Well, it's, it's one of those things. I don't think it's the idiot at all. It's like, okay, you spent a ton of money on these dies. It's like going and buying a brand new pickup. That's what I was going to ask. Everybody goes yeah. and like, you go and buy a brand new pickup. There's a couple of things that after you buy that pickup, you don't, you aren't really happy about. You're like, well, it kind of is shitty here and here, but you're not going to grab the Sawzall and start taking it to the brand new pickup. You're just going to kind of deal with it. Well, and that's the thing with the dies. You're like, the dies definitely, like, I've been there with tools where you're like, I don't know enough about this subject, so maybe this is how it's supposed to be. I don't know. Like, I don't want to fuck them up. So if I don't, if I just do nothing, then maybe that's the best. <laughs> that's that's where I was for sure. Yes, yeah. I was like, I don't know anything about these dies, or you know, to take a wire feed welder and make it worse. You know, yeah. um, so you spent so much money, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, I know where I'm going to wire feed weld on. There's not going to be, you know, I mean, all those came heat treated themselves. So, you know, and, you know, I didn't know very much about heat treating, you know, uh, and the differences because, God, you know, that's a whole different. Oh, it's a big old can of worms. It's a big old can of worms. But it's it's funny, though, like. You probably set, like you probably dealt with those dyes. I'm guessing for quite a while, like you said, two years, <laughs> and then it probably took you an afternoon or two days, like to probably weld and grind on them, and then they're tit. You yes. just like they were running away. You're like, yes, and it's the worst because like for the next two three weeks, you're like, why did I not do that earlier? Like I had everything to do it even. <laughs> it was all sitting in here. Like, I should have just done it. Like, I'm a good procrastinator. <laughs> oh man, I'm the best at it. Like that's why I, I know exactly how you're talking because I will deal with that forever. Like I will yeah. be every time. So and so, it'll take somebody coming over and be like, "Why don't you just fix this?" I'm like, yeah. well, because I just been deal dealing with it. With it. <laughs> like, like, yeah, it's, kinda, it's that old that old rifle with the scopes a little <laughs> off. You're like, no, it's off. Like, can I just always aim a little off with it? It's easier than fixing it, I guess. One hundred percent. Oh man. So now you're like you're kind. Of, what once you had the die fixed, did you feel like you were just running away with the whole deal? Like you were finally making stuff, or was it struggles were still there? Well, the struggle was still there with heat treat uh, because then I located a heat treat company down in Phoenix. Because you know when you're doing ten, twenty. 30 knives, you know, a month, um, you know, doing your own heat treatings fine. And I didn't have an oven or anything. I was, um, you know, doing it with a torch and, uh, doing my tempering, you know, 
with colors and but then you start getting into bigger numbers and so I found the heat tree company down in Phoenix and uh, every time I would get chips and cracks and breaks and everything call them up talk to them go down show them exactly so I remember going down one time and I took a pair of pliers and I said okay here's my blade when people come up under you know uh, was you trying to a, explain a bar how it's or being something used. and they they twist up this is what's happening so I'd take this pair of pliers and I'd break it right in front of them and they're like well this is what all of our knives that come into our shop are at and I'm like well these aren't getting used like knife knives. These are <laughs> these are getting used by cavemen that are just <laughs> abusing the hell out of them. You know, I need something a little more forgiving. And so that was a year or two that I had to go through a lot of struggles there. And, Shit. and did you and like that people hear that, too, of like, oh, a year or two. But it's not just a year or two of you dealing with it. It's a year or two of then you happen to listen to everybody else come back it's a, to you. It's a year or two of losing um, customers and business and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's it's scary and it's embarrassing and it's I I was ashamed and um, you know that I I literally wanted to just pull my hair out. It was it was horrible when people would reach out to me with those issues and i hated it man it, it is so hard and it's not like you're not trying either <laughs> right you're trying to figure it out it's like you're like i'm not trying to have this shit break <laughs> right yeah. like, this i want it to be I, good <laughs> yeah i want it to be good and i want to help you out too so like hang so with then me i can here. run a business <laughs> like, as I'm well like, and I, I definitely got to say thank you to everybody that did hang with me through all my trials and tribulations, for sure. Part of the process, I would believe. It is, but when you're a buyer, I don't know if everybody wants to hang with you, uh, you know, through those things. I don't know. It's, it's always funny. Like, horseshoers bitch about clients that are like, oh, man, I made one little mistake and the client fired me. But then a horseshoe will try a tool out and it'll make one little mistake and they're like, well, fuck them. You yeah. know, it's like, well, you're acting like the client that you hate right now. It's like, we're you're, very you're, judgmental. <laughs> for oh sure. my gosh, man. Like horseshoers are some of the worst clients. <laughs> I have had. Like, so would that <laughs> make us hypocrites essentially then? Or oh, no? we're, the worst. we're the worst hypocrites ever, ever, yeah. man. Like, it's just like, it's so funny. We are like, sucks. Uh, <laughs> Some are great. I'm not saying all of them are. Like I, I have some horseshoers that I'll still sell stuff to because it's like they are just great clients and people to deal with and friends. But it's like then some of them, it's like, man, I don't think I'd piss on you if you're on fire. Like <laughs> it's like you just complain so much. Like it's just not worth it. <laughs> so how many years total do you think like you've been working on perfecting like these knives and getting into the process of where you're at now? Um, so my back got real bad shooting horses, um, which was kind of one of my, well, heck, you know, maybe I'll try doing these for, you know, an extra side deal because my shoeing basically pathetically came down to, you know, three horses, you know, five days a week and, you know, three horses, you know, my back was bad. And, mm -hmm. um, I, I just, it was, it was, I was, I was eating a tremendous amount of ibuprofen every day. Uh, and so I was hoping that it would go. And then I started guiding, um, in the meantime as well, just to try to keep things going. And, yeah. uh, it so it was probably f four years before they started actually catching on and then i was guiding and i'd be out in places that i would have no service and then i'd get to a spot that would actually have service and i'd see hey i just wanted to talk to you i'm interested in you know buying and i'm like oh geez you know and, and my very one of my 
first custom, you know, shops that was going to start buying from me um, was trying to get a hold of me, and I was way out on a piece of country with no service. And I'm like, wow, maybe I got to start rethinking this, and you know, uh, not guiding as much because I was spending a lot of time uh, out in the mountains for deer always, and so. Yeah, it was probably, it took four years, almost five, before I started getting comfortable and halfway happy. Yeah. Has your process or changed much recently in the last few years on the way, like, you're going about the knives? So, like, knives that you produced, like, four years ago, is the process still the same as, like, a knife that's coming out today? The process is the same. Um, grinds, uh, shape look i think have changed in the last two mm -hmm. and i think i was talking to you riley at the winter clinic in 21 maybe yeah and we were talking and i said god i said if i could just take back you know the knives i sold yesterday or the day before and give them this batch you know because every batch was still even in 21 every or was it 20 or 21 every batch was still getting better and better and better and better. And I was always ashamed of the last batch and the last batch and the batch before that. And, um, you know, and it's one of those things that I don't know if anybody's ever super freaking uh -huh. happy. I don't know if I'll ever reach that spot. Yeah. And so I don't know if you're, you, you being a builder, Gavin, you being a builder, are, are we ever satisfied? I, yeah, that's our, tough question it's to hard answer. it's hard to be satisfied and i think that always i i don't think i'm as bad as i used to be i i think i am happy but you know maybe maybe i got a little flat on one batch um and you know somebody runs it through a dry foot and it kind of you know just doesn't uh doesn't break but a lot of little chips where I got a little flat on just my sharpening process. You mm -hmm. know, there's always things that I wish were different. And, you know, honestly, I look at every single knife and I'm happy with them at this stage and then I'll do that stage and that stage and then I hate them, you know, and I'm <laughs> I'm pissed and I'm like, God, it's just, you know. So I, I, there's a lot that goes on where I'm fighting my own head. Yeah, just that's to be what, happy That's with what it. brings a product to the next level. If you were just going through the paces and you're like, yeah, it's pretty good, it's pretty good. Well, that's what they would be is pretty good. But to be <laughs> like a great product, they need you need to be somebody that's like scrutinizing every single step of each part. And I, I think I, I know what you're talking about that you're like, oh, are we ever happy? And it's like, well, it's, I'm sure it's like with my tools, when I make tools, it's like I don't think I'm a shit tool maker. I, I think I'm an okay tool maker. I think I was a shit tool maker one time. I don't think I was very good. And like now I think my tools are pretty good, but I'm always trying to perfect things. I'm trying to make yeah. a, a, all these little, and it's probably things people will never, ever know. You know what I mean? It's like, right. but it's, it's things you're noticing because you're looking at them so in, de in depthly and you're just trying to get better. And it's like our trade is always evolving and growing and getting better and people and like you're so involved with comp the competition world and everything else too like i'm sure you get a lot of feedback from top hands and they're like man if this i like a knife like this to do this part it's like well you're going to start incorporating some of those things into your tools and it's like yeah they're going to keep getting sweeter and sweeter as time goes on because we just learn and nippers aren't what nippers used to be they look completely different now like yeah. they are a, di right. a different tool yeah, it's like you asked me uh, the other day when I was on the phone with you, Dan, what I liked about the one that I just uh, came across from the contest that you donated. And I was going through my drawer, and I had a knife that I had bought from, uh, I don't remember where I got it, but I bought it like three or four years ago, and it was in there. And it came to me as after I got off the phone with you. I was like, I do notice a difference between the one that I used just now versus that one. Like, there was a vast improvement in it, so like... I could even tell the difference just from the one I used then to now, like it has improved. So I can see what that's, you're saying. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I love it because Riley, you, you won division three, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got second. <laughs> yeah. 
Congratulations yep. to both of you on that. That's cool. Well, Thank thanks. you. Seems like it was a good contest, huh? Yeah, you win was, some, you lose some. It was fun. Uh, yeah, ben, ben put together a really cool list that was like, it was different than what everybody, like that we've been making roadsters and stuff too. So it was like, you had to put this enormous thick toe in it. Yeah. And like, that was one of the stipulations. You had to have a toe thicker than five eighths. Yeah. And so it was like, it was a bear. To get that yeah, thing just to get it. It was, it was, it was a bear. <laughs> It was a it was an interesting list though. It yeah, because five was eights cool. wasn't enough. You, you had a bump more, huh? <laughs> no, yeah, like he did, like, yeah, that he wanted school. that thing thick. I think his specimen was like th- almost three quarters of an inch. It was stout. It was oh. wild. <laughs> yeah, it was stout. <laughs> As I saw, I was like, I don't, I don't. If I do a little bunch, anything today, I'm just gonna put that toe in there. <laughs> like that's <laughs> all I'm gonna do. <laughs> just keep whacking that thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of, you donate a lot of knives for like contests as prizes and incentive. Uh, yeah. When did you start putting like the engraving and stuff in there? Because like this one has like the Willamette Valley Div Three on yeah, it. Yeah, that stuff's cool. How'd you so, come across that? I started doing that for the WCB because the WCB means everything to me, um, and they do so much. And mm-hmm. I was. You know, I was hit up with, you know, other contests, state contests that I was like, well, you know, I'll, I'll throw out, you know, some nice wood or something like that um, and leave it at that and just leave it for the WCB. And um, but, you know, kind of like rodeo and the whole entire rodeo world, the horseshoe and world's the same way where you see these team ropers walking around with every single sponsor and every, you know, all over themselves. And that's kind of where it's at is, uh, you know, so I wanted to incorporate that with my, my knives and my handles and uh, show appreciation to, um, you know, people that are still keeping everything going and everything. And um, it was just a little something that added to, you know, and gave back. Uh, I think, giving back to the Shun um, community is massive and huge. And uh, you remember being in your first division one contest ever, you were just happy to walk out of there with, you know, a door prize, you know, or the free t-shirt that came with it, you know? So I think, you know, Jim Porter has literally donated to every single contest you know, that we've had in every state. And he's been so gracious. And um, I I think it's huge to give back. Was that that equipment expensive to get for the engraving? So the equipment is expensive. And when I first wanted to do it, I just kind of uh, looked in Prescott to see who's doing it. And nobody wanted to touch me. They're like, no, we don't have time for that kind of crap. And it's probably so, a good thing they uh, didn't touch you. Huh? <laughs> it's, it's probably a good thing they didn't actually touch you. Yeah. It, <laughs> so, I'm not even going to go there. So, <laughs> uh, found one guy that said, yeah, that sounds interesting. You know, why don't you come over to the house? And so this is three years now and we've become pretty good friends and uh he's got a pretty expensive machine i think it's a thirty thousand dollar machine and um you know we sit there and we blue tape every single knife before we let it run full force on the handle and uh you know and i cannot do anything with computers and so it works out me using him for now and uh maybe one of these days i might get my home but um, he can't do aluminum or steel. So I think it was two years ago at Fort Worth. I did an aluminum handle and, yeah. uh, oh, yeah. Tyler poor did a beautiful job on that. Um, he's amazing. I just wish he was closer, you know, and then I think he just moved to Houston, right? Yeah. I think, I think I saw something about that. Yeah. I'm not sure, but he does phenomenal work and I wished I could get more but it's kind of like 
uh, I get them done, you know, a couple, two weeks before the contest. And then I just kind of, if I could think ahead and know exactly how I want to do everything, I would love to send them to Tyler because he does such nice work, but yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's a great little touch on them because it's kind of like poor would do that too with hammers. They like give away hammers to places and he'd put the contest is like date and everything on there. Yeah. It's such a good thing that when you're at your client and you pull that hammer out or you pull that knife out and they notice that it has something on it, like that it looks like a trophy and that it brings the conversation up. They're like, oh, what's that? You're like, well, I want it. I wanted a contest. Yeah. And now right. they're like, oh, there's people out here competing. You know, yeah. other, especially if you're like a boarding stable or something like that. Like, that's why we all want the shiny metal best shod foot bucket. Yeah. And so when you go to your client, you're like, see that? Check best it out. shod foot. <laughs> like, Check it doing, out. That's who's doing your horse. <laughs> <laughs> The guy with this Damn bucket. Right. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> it's such a like a, a badge on and it brings it to our client to like show that there is this world going on in the horse shoeing world, you know, that like we're out here competing. And I, I think it's funny too because like these guys that say that competition don't matter sometimes are the guys that shoe like a bunch of show horses and they're like you literally shoe for competitive horses. The whole thing is to rank people. That's what you guys yeah. all brag about too. And so you guys are like, this horse is a winner. Like, yeah, but you're not. Like it's like so that's kinda of like that's... man, the horse is nothing if he hasn't won something, you know? It's like so you might want to go try to win some things. So like or at least go get I haven't a thought about it that there. way. That's <laughs> actually really good. I like it that. It always yeah. cracks me up. It's like, man, it's like you're out here bragging that you're shooing these like highly competitive horses, but then you the same breath you say the competition in the horseshoeing world doesn't matter. It's like <laughs> all competition matters. That's like I tell you. It's like we all yeah. like being ranked somewhere. Like, Everything's a competition, like, yeah. Showing like but yeah, it's always always a funny thing. I think it's a great deal that you have the the little trophy on there. It lets everybody know that you went and did something. That you're not just hanging out. And then how did you come up with the with the bullet in your handle? What gave you that uh idea? Um, you know, I I uh I was looking for something to just stick in a handle just so it wasn't just a piece like of wood touchboard. and so I started grabbing some 223 and some 45, uh, you know, brass casings off the mm -hmm. ground. And I'm like, wow, that'd be cool if I, you know, put that in there, you know, um, because every knife, you know, has a lanyard hole. And I think I even did a lanyard hole in a couple of my very first ones. <laughs> and wow, you know, this is so cool. I'm so great, you know. And so then I started putting the bullet on. I'm like, well, shoot, every, every shooter out there loves shooting guns and everything. So I started putting those in and everybody started thinking, oh, that's really cool. And yeah. a buddy of mine, Bob Earl's like, well, why don't you just start, you know, having some made that, you know, say Dan Salcedo instead of Winchester 45 ACP on them, you know? And I'm like, oh, well, that's a really great idea, you know? <laughs> uh, so that was pretty cool uh and that's is, how that came about is that something you have to source out and have done as well then Those... so i uh i was shooting uh next uh three towns down from me uh is wickenburg um and so basically my shoeing area was 85 percent on one road in prescott and then Jeez. the other uh, that was just one road that's where <laughs> all of the you know the better end horses were in town, ended up right. building at so yeah. then i uh kept my horses down in wickenburg um and so i was shooting for this guy and i'm like pat so what do you do in your garage i always hear an air compressor going you're always in there he's like oh i got a full machine shop in there and i said so what do you <laughs> what do you machine he's like i machine everything there's the machine and he's like, why don't you stop up on the... And I've been chewing for the guy for like a year uh -huh. before I, you know, and I was just starting, you know, into my knives at that time. And um, so he says, well, come up to the house and check it out. So I walk through and it's like 
Iowa, turn, Iowa, <laughs> turn, Iowa, machine, 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 machine. No you know, waste of space. He had so many uh, CNC machines packed into this place, and every single one of them was doing a different job. Um, so I said, hey, could you <laughs> make these, you know, brass casings? He's like, yeah, I can make those. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. And so he started doing those, and I'm like, do your machines do wood? And he said, yeah, I could do wood. I don't like to do wood because it makes so much mess. And I said, man, I'd really love if I could start getting handles done because handles were killing me, you know, making that slot, making the step. I've and wondered how you get it the same every time. So he took over doing those two things for me. Nice. Um, and that's been just huge thank god um huge so yeah and you know these are all people that you know i shot for and that's what i was gonna say i I love how close your story is of like that it just like you're just talking to larry you're like yeah maybe i guess i will make some knives you know and you're like (laughs) you just found some of the next town over to help you with this part it's like man i think that's a like true grassroots little business right there it's pretty cool well, you know, how many times have we been shooing at people's places? And it's like, what are you doing with that? Oh, I don't know. I'll shoe a couple of horses for it. You know, oh, I mean, yeah. we always have that trading thing going with all of oh, our I clients always, you know. I am bad about I'll, I love trading. <laughs> I, I, like Items for items is like my favorite thing to do. I wish I had more of it. I don't have hardly any because I'm in all barns and they all use all their shit. (laughs) (laughs) Like I got a friend, he works for mostly all backyard people and he comes home with lawnmowers today. He'll come home with weed whackers tomorrow. Exactly. Horse trailers. Like he comes home with tractors, just like trades them and buys them. And dude, it's crazy. My shop actually came uh, from somebody I was shooting for. Your shop came from what? Somebody I was shooing for. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> they said, hey, I'm looking at getting rid of this, uh, you know, and it was kind of um, one of those carporty things, you know, that people buy and put up and they store their vehicles under. Uh-huh. So I said, well, I'll shoe seven of your horses for it. And they're like, perfect, sounds good. So I shot their horses that day, went down there the next weekend and picked it up, put it up, put a cement down and then uh, framed in the backside and the front side, uh, kind of batten board and put two big doors on it. And yeah, that's, uh, Damn. so yeah, you can trade for everything when you're. It happened to us. <laughs> It's okay. Sorry, it's okay, everybody. We yeah. still suck at recording things. We're still just horseshoers. <laughs> We're learning. Try, trying to play radio, man. <laughs> it's part of How the process. Long is, uh, Fortune Brain's been going on now. Over a year. Almost, like, like, almost, almost a year. Well, I'm not very That's good awesome. at dates, but it's pretty much a year. It's pretty almost. Much a, like it's pretty, pretty cool that we've. Uh, it's went by really fast, really. Cause it's pretty fun. It's just like we like ske- it's a scheduled time to talk to with our friends. Yeah. I have watched. I I tried listening in my shop just sound, and it's always fun to actually watch it. Um, yeah. And funny. I've watched a lot of them. Um, I'm probably behind a handful, but uh, I've enjoyed every single one that you guys have done. It's been uh, well, it's you. been great. You get to actually. Understand and know people uh, yeah. better this way, um, and so I well, think man, what you guys are doing is great. It's you've like you've gone to a bunch of contests. As I've talked to you a bunch of times at contests, but it is hard. It's like you get somewhere to a contest, and there's so many people that you want to talk to, but you, there's only so much time. So you might only get to like really have a deep conversation with three, maybe four guys. So you always miss out on talking to a bunch of dudes, and so it is kind of nice to like. Well, just us doing this, I've learned more about certain people that you're like, is 
a time to actually like deep dive into some stuff. It's pretty cool. For sure. Um, at Edgewood, I literally got to meet you, Gavin. We got to talk for a few minutes, yep. and then I think we were, you were hanging out in the lobby, and I was running in to go shower before the banquet. And, you know, it's funny because you leave contest and you're just going, God, I wish I was able to talk to so-and-so a little bit more. I wish I could have, or I didn't even get to, when I left this Edgewood contest, there was a handful of people that I wanted to actually even meet that were there that I didn't yeah. even get to meet. And I was so upset about that because um, yeah. it does go quick and there's a lot going on. Yeah, it, it is. It is so there's so many people there, so much to do. And especially for a guy like you, I'm sure like you're talking business a bunch with people there. People are wanting to meet you and talk to you. You know, it's like so it's probably it's hard to turn around sometimes without having somebody right there ready to meet you. And you're happy to meet them. Right. Like it's because they're excited to talk to you about your product, what you what they've been using. That's always great. And the conversations of just everybody and everything is always just <laughs> great. Um, I, I enjoy, you know, I enjoy the contest uh, a lot now because I just really get to go and hang out. And, you know, back before the WCB, you know, when you'd go to a contest, you didn't get to touch, you, you barely got to touch, unless it was nighttime and we were partying. You didn't yeah. get to talk to anybody because we were all doing this heats at the same time. Uh, yeah, that is so true. It's it's a lot of fun going to these and just getting to talk with everybody and see everybody because it, it really is a family, I think. 100%. It is. And good friends. I mean, it's it's truly good, good, good friends. You know, we've also heard, like, other people come up to, like, when we were in the, there in Edgewood, like, people would come up to me and say like man just by listening to like your podcast or whatever like it's made me more comfortable to like go up and talk to somebody like Chris Madrid or you know uh whoever else we've had on the podcast you know like there's this like stigma around like they're these high profile guys but really they're just regular people yeah that's it's it's funny it's like when you like that's what I kind of thought about Austin Edens when I first met him at Classic. I was like, this guy's super serious, doesn't want to talk to anybody. And then you yeah. later you find out, well, he's just throwing up. Like he, <laughs> the guy, he, was, he was just having a, a nervous breakdown before his go. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I couldn't believe that when he said that. So to be funny. honest, <laughs> <laughs> what oh, my, great. one of my fondest memories that I think it was here in Arizona. There was always a rivalry, you know, at the contest, you know, with Texas and, you know, Arizona and California, you know, there's always this rivalry. And oh, yeah. it was, I think, Bill Poor, Austin Edens, and Todd Walker, they came driving into the arena with their truck and their trailer, and there's uh, Austin and Todd in the back of the truck with the Texas flag Holding it up, you know, standing on <laughs> their ground like they were crossing the Delaware, coming in with the Texas flag. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know, it's it's those kinds of things that you know. <laughs> that's that the good great. shit. <laughs> and if he does watch this, I I wonder if he'll him and Todd will remember doing that. That's was, so funny. It was funny, and there's a little shout out to Chris there. <laughs> yeah, oh, he's the man. Hell yeah, he is the, the man. Champ. The chance. Does anybody ever get comfortable talking to Chris? <laughs> I still don't. No. Yeah, no. Like, I still man. don't. He, he, yeah, he's one of those. Even like if he's looking at my tools or something. Like, it's been a couple of times I've looked over and he's like looking at my tools and I'm not close. I'm like, I'm not going over there. I'm not going. Over there. I don't even want to know what he like. They're crap. I know they're crap. Dude. Just put it down. <laughs> His yeah. eyes are so good, and he's such a perfectionist that you're like, oh, man. He's seeing all the flaws. <laughs> like, all the flaws. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even – I already know. <laughs> <laughs> he is a super nice guy, and he wants to help you out. But it is like, man, he's he's the champ. Like, he yeah. Is, he is the man. It's cool. Well, well man, Dan, Dan I think we're getting – do you have any tips for people on sharpening and taking care of their hoof knives? 
Um, I do have two videos out, and I did these videos quite a while ago. I probably need to refresh them um, because, as we all know, sharpening is uh, a pain in the ass. Uh, yeah. You know, I remember I'd get a brand new Shane Carter knife that you just sit there and look at it, and then you look at the foot, and you're like, oh, am I going to bleed this thing? You know, and then... A week and a half later, you couldn't make it bleed if you had to, you know. Um, <laughs> sharpening has always been one of those things. Um, I do have a couple of videos. I have one video out on rehabbing uh, your knife when it starts to get all cattywampus, you know, nice. where your, your hook is, you know, like that and your spine is like that, you know, yeah. and it just starts to get astray. Um when uh, Craig and I went over to Scotland, uh, I got to meet the Norwegian team, and uh, one yeah. of the guys just hit me up um, and showed me his knife, and it was damn near down to the spine, and he had it just, it was perfect, it was beautiful. And I'm like, damn, man, you have that thing spot on. And he's like, yeah, I just watched your rehab video, and it, it came out <laughs> nice. pretty nice. So. Because uh, usually when they get down to the spine, you know, they just really get a stray on us. Um, so I do have two videos out. Um, and, you know, if anybody ever has any questions, I'm always here um, for somebody to hit me up on Facebook. And uh, I'll answer any question anybody has. Can they find those videos on, like, your Facebook then? YouTube. YouTube? Yep. Just Salcedo Knives or Dan Salcedo? Uh, yes, just Salcedo and... Uh, All right. Rehab knives should pop up. Perfect. Cool. Well, Dan, you guys a, know uh, how YouTube works better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> figured we'd give you a shout out and uh, have a place for people to find put it. it. Put them in the show notes or something. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Dan, a question that we like to ask our guests on here is uh, we call it a Mount Rushmore. So, who would be like four people that you look up to and hold high regard that you kind of give a lot of respect to that? got you to where you are so i have given this some thought because you guys do ask this and i i've watched enough of your videos and um you know i think uh everybody right off the bat everybody loves to say their parents and yada da, yada da. i think uh as far as the industry goes um craig uh, Craig has had more influence in my career than anybody. Uh, Mark Milster, uh, was always there and treated me unbelievably, uh, back when, and was always there for questions. Kelly Vermeer was another one that was helped me through all of my divisions and was always eager to help me. There's, you know, been so many people on all levels that have helped me and, you know, uh, the list could go on and on, but uh, those people have been super, super good to me. The industry has been super, super good to me and I just uh, appreciate everybody that's been there. Yeah. Those are, some, those are some great people right there on that list. Absolutely. I think Craig might be batting for the win of on – the number on more the most people's Mount Rushmore. Yeah, like he might <laughs> might be the first guy on Mount Rushmore. <laughs> he's, given, he's given a ton to the industry. And the, yeah, uh, yeah, it's huge. It's awesome. Thank you very. That's yeah. I think that's a great one. Well, Dan. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. And if uh, anybody wants to find Dan's products, I know you can just go to wellshaw.com. And I know for sure they sell Dan Salito knives. And you guys can go ahead and put in code BRAINS and you'll get a little gift. He's yeah. uh, kind of mixing it up with what he's throwing in there. So use the code and let them know that you appreciate helping us out with the show. That's huge. So thank you very much, Wellshod. And thank you very much, Dan, for taking some time out of your night and chatting with us, man. We appreciate it a bunch. Very cool. We appreciate fun. you, Dan. Thank you and guys thanks very for, much. Thanks for putting up with the technical difficulties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Learning it, is bumps. It, Learning is. Bumps. yeah. <laughs> it is what it is. It is what it is. 
Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it, guys.